All right, this morning I want to preach on door-to-door soul winning. So it's a sermon on evangelism. I want to encourage everyone to get involved in evangelism, but also I want to explain the reasoning uh, for why we go door-to-door soul winning. You, know, you might think, um, you know, we're just going door-to-door soul winning because that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. We're just trying to be like Jehovah's Witnesses. Or you say, oh, we're just going door-to-door soul winning because, oh, that's just what, uh, you know, the churches you come from, that's just what they do, you're just doing that, and that's just what they do. And it's not. I mean, I've actually thought through uh, the different ways you can e- evangelize, and um, I-, I believe that this is a, a necessary method. But I'll go through that reasoning a bit uh, later on in the sermon, but I want to explain to you why we have door-to-door soul winning and why we will always have door-to-door soul winning. Uh, in this church, and it's one of our, it is our main ministry, and I think it's one of the most effective ones as well in terms of getting the gospel out there. Um, but first of all, let's talk about the Great Commission. We just read there in uh, Matthew 16, uh, where Jesus says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But we see the Great Commission actually mentioned in all four of the gospels. So in John 20, you see it here near the end, <clears throat> verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Right? So it's not that we have, we particularly have the power to forgive sins. We we have that power by preaching the gospel. And if people, we persuade people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how they have their sins remitted. And if we don't, you know, and they don't believe on Jesus Christ, then their sins will be retained. Luke 24, verse 46, and he said unto, the, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. <coughs> so we see here near the end, of all the Gospels, Jesus is, you know, getting his disciples to go out and preach the Gospel, right? It's the last thing he said to them. Mark 16, 15, that's what we read this this morning, Gershon read, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. So some people get tripped up on this verse, but, you know, baptism is not required for salvation, which is why it's reiterated in the second part of the verse, that only if you believe not, you shall be damned. And that baptism could be talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost as well. But don't get tripped up on verses like those. Matthew 28, this is where we get the Great Commission from. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So these were the last words spoken by Jesus. You know, we know this is the Great Commission. And unfortunately, it's become the Great Omission in a lot of churches. It's become the Great Omission in a lot of Christians' lives. You know, when you think about when was the last time you preached the gospel to somebody? When was the last time you had a conversation with somebody? You explained to them, like, this is how you go to heaven. And you went through some verses with them, like, in depth. I'm not talking about, you you can't really say, like, if you meet somebody and you're like, oh, I'm a Christian, oh, you're a Christian, oh, you believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, oh, I preach the gospel to them. Like, you know, is that really preaching the gospel to them? Just so you say, like, oh, I believe in Jesus, you know. You know, are you being a witness? Yes, but I'm ta- what I'm talking about when I say preach the gospel is like, you know, this is why Matthew 28 says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Like, it does require, you know, when you talk to somebody about the gospel, it requires a bit of an in-depth conversation. It's not going to be, like, just a two-minute conversation. And even when you hear about people getting saved at the door, like, some people have this idea is, like, oh, if somebody gets saved at the door, it's like, oh, are they really getting saved and all that sort of stuff? Well, it requires a bit of time, first of all, that you spend with them. And second of all, the people that get saved at the door are generally people that have already sort of had the groundwork laid. You know, they might already be going to a church, but then they're just trusting work salvation. They're just a bit mixed up on it. You know, and those people generally that you get saved at the door are people that you, know, you tweak them a bit, they realize, oh, yeah, I was trusting work, and they're just happy to believe on Jesus Christ. But, you know, there are people that you talk to at the door that you might spend an hour with talking about things because they, they, they have objections. They don't really understand these things. It takes, it takes a while. And this is what I mean by, you know, when was the last time you had an 
in-depth conversation with somebody where you were trying to persuade them to believe on Jesus Christ and you were going, showing them different verses. Maybe they were Christian from a different uh, you know, Christian denomination or maybe they were Catholic or Orthodox and you're going to different verses trying to convince them not to believe on work salvation or maybe they're a Muslim or maybe they're an atheist and you're talking to them about you know, uh, you know, that there's a God and, and the design and all that sort of stuff. I'm talking about these sorts of conversations, you know, not just your fly-by-night kind of conversations. Because that's what God would expect of us. Right? When he's saying, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian, to teach all nations. And these were the last words before Jesus ascended. You know, it ought to be the mission statement of every church. And we've got to remember, this is the purpose for which we are here. So when you think about in your own life, you know, when was the last time you preached the gospel and you don't even remember when, you've got to ask yourself the question, are you living up to the purpose that God has for us? You know, like this is the purpose of the church and the church is not just me. You know, you need to understand that. Like the church is not just Victor, we are the church. This is our mission as believers here. And the whole idea of coming together as a church is that we provoke each other to love and to good works to do more of this Great Commission. But the one, the one part of the Great Commission I'm talking about today is the first part, right? To teach, to preach the gospel, make sure that we're being involved in that. So don't turn the Great Commission into the great omission in your life. You know how people always talk about there's like that big elephant in the room, you know, that, that it's just like that thing that nobody wants to talk about but it's there. That's what soul winning is like in some churches. It's like you get together and everyone's great, everyone's friends and all this activity. There's this big elephant in the room that like a whole bunch of people are just not taking part in the Great Commission at all. Um, but, you know, that's why I'm, I'm bringing out this elephant today. So we can talk about this elephant that's sitting in the corner there and uh, explain to you why, why we do it um, the way we do. So preaching the gospel, whose responsibility is it to preach the gospel? Is it just, is it just the church leaders? You know, I don't believe so. Some people make the argument when they look at the uh, verses for the Great Commission and they say, well, Jesus was just talking to the disciples at the time, like to his apostles. You know, so, so therefore, you know, that's why you know, they'll say things like you know, in Mark 16, or we, we saw earlier on in Mark 16, and it says, oh, you know, that's why, you know, this was directed at the apostles. And then they'll try and make the argument that it's not really for the church today, or maybe it's just only for the church leaders because he was just only talking to his apostles. Uh, which, which I, don't, I don't agree with, but that's what they'll say. And they'll say, like, see, because, look, he told them to go preach the gospel, and they're doing all these miraculous things. Like, we're not doing all these things, so was the, were, the, were these words for us, you know, to go into all the world and preach the gospel? If these words aren't for us, like, we're, we're not going to drink poison and lay hands on people and all that sort of stuff. So, look, I get the argument, but, the, 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 you know, if Mark 16 is all we've got, maybe they can argue that. But we, that's not all we have, right? So how do we know that this... This mission that was given to the apostles continues on to every believer, right? And, and the way I argue it, argue it, and I'll show you this morning, and, and, and some of you already know this argument, but I'm just reminding you, you again, is we look at Paul's example. Right? At Paul's example. Look at, look at what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, says about himself. 2 Corinthians 5.18 And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, what does it mean to reconcile? Right? To, to, get, to have, have peace with somebody again. So, so you know, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? How do we get that? Well, we believe on Jesus Christ. So he's committed unto us that word of reconciliation, that we go out, verse 20, as ambassadors. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody that goes representing somebody else. So who are we representing? Jesus Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. So you see, that's the, the job of the soul winner, of the evangelist, the person that's going out to preach the gospel, is that they are beseeching people on God's behalf because God has given us this task to go out and tell people to come and be saved. We pray you in Christ's stead 
<coughs> be ye reconciled to God. First Corinthians 9. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Look at, look at, I, what I want you to see in this passage of 1 Corinthians 9 is I want, I want you to see Paul's attitude towards preaching the gospel, towards this ministry that has been committed unto us as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So he's saying if he does it willingly, he's going to be rewarded. If he doesn't do it willingly, he's commanded to anyway. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So that's a statement that's more relative, uh, relevant to the Corinthian church. For though I be free from all men... Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So you can see here the, the sort of effort that Paul went to to try and win people, right? So, I mean, we should try and follow in his footsteps the, the effort that he, that he went to to try and win people to Jesus Christ. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. All right? So, so this is Paul's example. This is what Paul did and he was following Jesus' command, the Great Commission. And then look at what Paul tells us to do in 1 Corinthians 4.16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So anyone who's trying to make the argument, I'm not saying anyone in this room is, but people that are trying to make the argument that the Great Commission is not for everyone uh, are missing the point that Paul is following the Great Commission. He was an evangelist and he's trying to encourage everyone to be followers of of him to do the same thing that he does. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. So is, is there people excluded from this great commission, from this task? No, because Paul is saying, hey, I want you to be followers of me, and this is what I'm teaching everywhere in every church. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Archaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not in Macedonia and Archaia, but also in every place, your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You see, so he's commending the Thessalonians here, saying you followed our example, right? And people knew about your faith. How? Because you know, obviously they had to go out, they go out and preaching and make, making it known. 1 Corinthians 11, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. So he's following Christ. He's telling people to follow him. And he's saying, this example I deliver to you. I want you to also, you know, follow what I'm doing. And we can see here when Jesus actually got his disciples together. It says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. You know, we have a children's song, you know, you know, I'll make you fishers of men if you follow me. He said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So you see how Jesus, to his disciples, said, hey, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Paul saying, hey, that's what I'm doing. I'm following Jesus. That's why Paul was such a great evangelist, right? He's following Jesus and he's saying, hey, he wants us to follow his example. So we need to be evangelists as well. 
you know, part of the Great Commission, preaching the gospel. Now, <clears throat> now, evangelism and preaching the gospel is not only for the men, but it's for the women as well. Right? And I always reiterate this point every time I preach on uh, soul winning, because sometimes in families, you know, wives tend to think that if my husband's doing all this stuff, that that's the equivalent of me doing it. And I, I don't think so. You know, I think we all need to be involved in the Great Commission, right? So, you know, just because your husband goes soul winning, that doesn't mean you're going soul winning. You know, you, because you need to be able to preach the gospel too, right? It's not just about, like, who goes or not. It's about getting better. It's also about setting the example for others, you know? So we want everyone involved in the Great Commission, everyone involved in preaching the gospel, um, and this is why we do it together. But look at what it says here in Acts 2. This is on the day of Pentecost when God pours out his spirit and they're preaching the gospel at, at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So you see here, God's will, even on the day of Pentecost, he didn't just pour out his spirit on the men, right? And that's why sometimes people get confused because, you know, men are leaders in the church to preach to the church. And when we're talking about preaching the gospel, we're not, pre we're not talking about preaching to a congregation. We're talking about preaching out in the highways and hedges, you know, out door to door, out in public places, preaching the gospel, explaining to people how to be saved. And here, where they went out preaching the gospel, he didn't just pour his spirit out on the men. He made it a point here that he's pouring his spirit out on the men and on the women, right? On his servants and on his handmaidens. I will pour out in those days on my spirit and they shall prophesy. You say Paul was such a great preacher. You know, he did all this work, but did Paul do it alone? No. Look at what he says in Philippians 4. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel. Right? It wasn't just laboured with me in the kitchen, laboured with me, you know, cleaning up, laboured with me and, you know, the things that women do. Right? It's not just that. He, they laboured with him in the gospel, which means that they also... Because, you, I mean, you can imagine, right? That, I mean, Paul's travelling, he's got women with him, he's got men with him. They're going out and they're preaching the gospel. It's not just... They're not just like today where they're just going event to event and there's just one badge preaching to a crowd, they're holding an event, they're holding an event. You know, because you can imagine that when they go and they're ministering to a bunch of people, explaining to them, going into a town, that the women also are going and talking to the women, going out and preaching the gospel too. So... This, this, you can see that it, it's, it's not just Paul, even though Paul gets a lot of the credit. You know, he gets a lot of the credit. He's, he's very well known. But you can see in his letters, he actually attributes you know, other people with him that are working with him, accomplishing this work. And we see in Philippians 4.3 that there are also women there preaching alongside with them. And that's what we see on the day of Pentecost. Okay? So it's not only for the men, it's for the women also. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's good enough for women to just say, like, you know, my husband goes soul winning for our family because I've seen that before. And men, you need to, you know, you need to make sure that your wife gets an opportunity to go soul winning. You know, that's why me and my wife, we alternate. Um, but you need to make sure, you know, your, your family gets an opportunity to go soul winning. And uh, this is why we, uh, like I said, me and, my, me and my wife rotate so that she has an opportunity too. Now, this is where I want to spend most of the time today. I don't know how long it'll take me to go through this. But I, I just want to explain to you, because I don't know how many of you um, haven't heard my reasoning for why we go door to door. And, and, and the reason why I want to explain is because I don't want you to just think we just go door to door because that's just what churches do. You know, and that's just a tradition we follow. And you say, like, oh, Victor is just trying to, like, oh, old school Christianity. And, you know, I've got some new fandangled methods that work better and everything like that. But then that's just old school. That's why I don't... No, like, there's, there's a reason why door-to-door -door is effective. And I'll explain to you uh, why, why that is, right? Now, when you think about how, how can you actually go out 
and explain to people about Jesus. You know, when you talk, think about all the ways you can do evangelism, right? Firstly, you ask, well, is it a passive method or a proactive method, right? What do I mean by that? Like passive meaning you don't do anything, you just wait for people to come to you, right? You wait for people to ask you. You know, you just go about your day and so, you know, somebody asks you or maybe you just, you know, you'll drop it like, oh, it's church on the weekend. Anyway, like, and they say like, you know, and then, you know, to start that conversation, you know, like that, that's what I mean by passive, where it's like people inquire with you. Um, or proactive. Proactive is when you actually make the effort. You may bring it up, right? And you, bring, you may bring it up in your circles of influence, or you may go out and actually go talk to strangers. Now, if you think about the Great Commission, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We see here also, when we look at the armor of God, and we talk about this, you know, that the feet, the boots in the armor of God is the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you can see the gospel of peace is about getting your shoes on. You know, why do you put your shoes on? Because you're going somewhere, right? You don't put your shoes on when you're just staying somewhere, right? Even the parable of the, the, the feast, right? And it says here, and the Lord said unto the servants, so this is after the people that were initially bidden didn't want to come, and then they went out and invited those that weren't invited, they came, and it's like, hey, there's still room. Right? There's still room. And what does he say? And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges, look at this, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Now, I don't think anyone would really dispute that this parable is talking about Jesus sending out the church, right? Sending out disciples, Christians, to, to go and preach the gospel, to bring people in to the house of God, to go out and compel them to come in. So, if, let's go back to this thought of like passive and proactive. I mean, when you read through the Bible, do you get this idea that God expects us to just have a passive type of method of evangelism, right? Like people will say things like, well, you know, do I have to like be in a soul winning ministry or evangelism ministry? Like, can I just talk to people I come across in my day-to-day -day life? I mean, when you read these verses in the Bible, I mean, do you think that cuts it? I mean, well, can you look at Jesus in the face and go, Jesus, is it okay if I just talk to people about you I come across in my day-to-day -day life, you know, it's convenient for me. I mean, surely you read the Bible and you see, you know, Paul's example and verses like this and you think, man, I, I, I should do at least more than what is just convenient to my own life. Surely. Right. So, don't you think God would expect more than just soul winning when it's convenient for you? This is why we have a scheduled time to go soul winning, right? Because it's to encourage you to go soul winning when you probably ordinarily would not. Now, what, are, what is a passive method of evangelism, right? A passive method of evangelism is what they call lifestyle evangelism. So lifestyle evangelism, if you're not sure of that term, is when you just go about your life as a, you know, a God-fearing Christian, and because your life is so blessed and you're so happy and you've got straight teeth and your wife is you know, beautiful and your kids are all healthy and all, they're going to ask you, like, what do you have? <laughs> and that's what the, the prosperity gospel preachers will tell you, right? So that's what they mean by lifestyle evangelism. Now, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious, but, you know, it's basically, you know, maybe you just got the joy of the Lord all the time, you know, and you know, you're happy all the time. And they think, oh, what's, you know, they attribute it to the fact that you're a Christian. And then, because they know you're a Christian, then they may ask you, hey, what, what do you have? Now, like I said, with the verses that we looked at. I mean, this, this, if somebody asks you, and, and you, know, you, you get you know, a portion of lifestyle evangelism in your life, I mean, is that a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. I mean, if somebody asks me, and you know, I'm sitting there, and they ask, oh, yeah, I heard you're a Christian. Like, you know, tell me a bit about that. Like, man, that's like being served on a silver platter, right? Like somebody just wants to hear what you have to say, you know, as opposed to trying to find people you know, that want to hear or that are looking, that don't have anyone to talk to. 
Now, what's the problem with lifestyle evangelism? Not, not only what I've talked about already, that it's not proactive, and I think God expects some proactiveness from us in terms of evangelism. But see, lifestyle evangelism only works if being a Christian means that there's a visibly positive effect. Right? So how does lifestyle evangelism work if, if you, know, you look like any other happy, unsaved person that's just enjoying life? You know, what's the difference? And also, it's a, it's a bad precedent as well, because what if your life is visibly worse as a Christian? You know, what if you get saved and your family disowns you, you know, in some circles? You know, what if, like, you know, I mean, I can't come up with just all the examples now, but my point is, like, what if your life doesn't get better after you get saved? You know, can you not, you, you can, how do you do lifestyle evangelism? What have you got to offer? You know, come, come live my terrible life being a Christian. You know, if, it's, if things are not going your way. You know, how did Job, how did Job do lifestyle evangelism when he's, when he's being persecuted by Satan? He's got boils, he's losing everything, he's losing his family. You know, nobody wants what Job has. Nobody's going to ask Job, hey, what do you, you know, your life's so great, what do you have? You know? So it, and it only works if your life is visibly better, if it's visibly worse. You know, it's only going to impact people that know you well enough. So how do you evangelize to people that you don't really know that well? You know, are you going to reduce your circle? You think about, you know, when Jesus says in Acts 1, hey, you'll be witnesses unto me, both in you know, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, it's the uttermost part of the world. You know, I show people verses like that. But some Christians have this idea like, you know, you know, I'm just reaching the people that I come across. That's my, it's my ministry. But don't you think God expects a bit more than that? What if they don't want what you have? You know, I remember talking to a guy out soul winning once and he told me, you know, you don't really need to go out and talk to people because, you know, we live in the information age. You know, if people want to find out, they'll, they'll go and seek out the information. But that's the problem. A lot of people are not seeking it out because Satan has them distracted with life. You know, and think about your own life. Now, you guys are uh, the ones that are like awake. You know, you know the truth. You're in a Bible-believing church. You want to grow. You want to learn. But even you get caught up in the rat race. Imagine the people that aren't saved. You know, are they going to be thinking about these things? So this is why sometimes it requires a Christian to go and wake them up. Hopefully take that opportunity that they otherwise would not take. And it's funny, like even in my own experience with someone, is that sometimes, you know, when you, if, sometimes you rock up to somebody's house, they'll have a conversation with you at that time. And, you know, maybe you get their number, but then you try and follow up with them, and they can't make the time to meet up with you again. And it just goes to show that, like, you know, sometimes people, they just take that opportunity to listen because you're there. <laughs> and um, that's, that's one of the advantages. <clears throat> now, let's talk about proactive methods. Proactive methods about getting a message out. So one way you can get a message out is you can broadcast to the masses. Right? So broadcast to the masses. So if you think about advertising, advertising is putting a message in front of you that you would not have to go seek out yourself. Right? So if you think about billboards, putting up posters, uh, radio ads, TV ads, things like that. Now, the problem with just advertising is, number one, depending on what sort of advertising method you use, it costs a lot of money. Right? And if you want to get people's attention, it requires some talent as well. You know, not everyone necessarily wants to put their face on a billboard or do you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's cost and talent prohibitive. Now, am I saying that it's a bad method? No, but it's just you know, not everyone is able to do it. Not everyone has the talent. Not everyone has the cost. Not only that, it's not interactive. You know, if you put up a billboard and somebody has questions, you know, because everyone's different, everyone has questions, how is that ad or that poster or that billboard interacting with them? You know, you have to put something very short, very sharp, and that's only, you know, can, can you come up with something? I mean, you know, companies spend millions and millions of dollars trying to advertise, trying to catch people's attention, you know? So it's not good at communicating more complex issues. And you know, like salvation, it can, it's simple, but it can be complex when people have objections and things like that. Now another method, so that's one method. One method is like advertising. Another method is 
open air preaching, you know, where the person is the billboard. You know, you go up into a public area, stand up on a box, and you start shouting at people, right? Or you start just talking into the crowd. You get a megaphone and you try and talk, hopefully draw a crowd and things like that. Now, there are some people that do that. Now, what are the problems there? Well, one is, is it takes a lot of boldness. You know, a lot of people are petrified of public speaking. You know, imagine going into a public area and doing some open-air preaching. It's not fair. Now, am I saying I'm against this? No, if people want to do that, you know, go ahead. I just don't think it's as effective as other methods, you know, like door-to-door -door solving, right? Because one is not everyone can do it. Not everyone is has that boldness. It's like a large step to go from not doing any soul winning to go go stand on that box over there and speak into a megaphone and tell everyone. You know, it's, it's, only, it's, it's a lot harder. It requires a loud voice. Not everyone is the type of person to speak out to a crowd. And again, it's not interactive, right? If you're just like saying a message, like, like this is not interactive either, right? This is your teaching, right? A bunch of people. But then at least you're teaching to an engaged audience, right? Whereas when you just go out and you're just, just talking to people that are just going about their day-to-day -day life, you know, I guess there are tricks that people try and use to try and get their attention. But it's not interactive in the sense that if they have questions and whatnot. Now, some people try and do it that way, and that's why I'm not necessarily against it. But then if they get off the soapbox and then they start talking to people, you know, now if they're doing it publicly, that requires a bit more boldness. Like I said, if you're doing it publicly, sometimes you see those public Q&As, requires a bit more boldness. But if they just go and they just start talking to people, you know, privately, you know, when they get off the soapbox and they go and talk to people that are sitting down and whatnot, hey, well, that's a lot like the other methods we're going to talk about later. Now, the other ways you can kind of do this sort of broadcasting to the masses is you do other public activities. And this is the route that a lot of churches go down, and I'll explain the issues here. They'll go like, okay, well, we can do a movie, movies, they make movies, or they show other movies, social, me social media posts is one of them. You know, you have a social media following. Podcasts, things like that, where, you know, you sort of do these other public activities where people can find you, right? Or a gospel meeting. You know, maybe you make a documentary. Some churches have, like, concerts and musicals and things like that. Maybe you're, like, uh, like the Creation Museum. You create a museum, you know, and you have an exhibit of some kind. Now, depending on what you do, it might cost a lot. And also, again, like with any other advertising method, you know, does anyone have the talent to do that, right? But the also, the other problem is, is if you create something that people then need to attend, and I, I would liken, like, say, podcasts and social media, because you need to get people subscribed to you, and even if they're subscribed to you, you, you know the problem with social media today, even if somebody's subscribed, will it appear in their feed, right? So you say like, oh, well, you have this social media outreach, but then how do you even get people to subscribe? And then once they're subscribed, how do you even get people, how do you even get it in their feed? Well, now you have to like promote it, right? So, so you're still going back to how do you get people to engage with this thing that you've created? If you have a meeting, how do you then go out to tell people, come to this meeting to listen to what we have to say? Well, now you're back at square one. Right? Because if you're going to go out, like let's say if you're going to go out and talk to somebody to try and get them to come to a meeting, you're already talking to them, why don't you just talk to them about the gospel there? <laughs> right? So we're sort of back at square one. <clears throat> now, the last thing, and this is what I'm sort of going down to, is you just engage individuals. You just engage individuals. Because like I said, you can, you, can, you can do all these other, and I'm not against any of these methods. I'm just saying that the problem is not everyone can do them. You know, not everyone has the talent to like, run a podcast. Not everyone has the, the money to just blow into like, plenty of advertising and things like that. So how do you, how do you duplicate that? You know, we say, okay, well, the way, the way we're going to uh, preach the gospel as a church is we're going down the long form podcast route. So now we're going to like start having like tra training everyone how to, you know, set up your AV and how to, podcast, how to get guests and, and you know, and then have a podcast. I mean, is that like the way we're going to go do soul winning where everyone just becomes podcast hosts? So you see how it's, it's not really duplicatable in terms of what should everyone be doing. So 
then it just comes down to engaging individuals, right? Which is just, just getting back to the basic of just talking to other people. Now, some people you can talk to is people that you know. So you say, you know, well, I'm going to talk to family, friends, colleagues, people that I come across in my day-to-day -day life, you know, like I said in the beginning, just, you know, when, when you're going about your day-to-day -day life, maybe you happen to stop and talk with somebody, and you talk with them. But let me ask you, like, what do you do when you run out of people to talk to? You know, like, I feel as though, like, when people talk to me about, like, you know, well, they, they just talk to people in their day-to-day -day life, yeah, well, that, that's, that's great. No, nobody's against that. But then how often do you do it? You know, like, you know, probably the, the people that say, like, well, I, I talk to people every now and then, how often do they do it? You know, like, once you've tried to talk with all your family, friends, and colleagues, and things like that, now what? You know, do you just stop trying to reach more people? Or do you think there's a responsibility to keep trying to reach more people? So, like I said, when we look at the Great Commission, do we get this idea that all that's expected of us is what's convenient for us? I think we get the idea that God wants more than that, right? Now, if I'm going out of my way to then talk to strangers, you know, let's say, you know, I remember having this conversation with somebody else. It's like, oh, you go to the shops? Well, maybe when I go to the shops, I might go an hour early and then go talk to a few people there and preach the gospel to them. It's like, hey, if you're doing that, that's great. Because that, that's, that's sort, of what, sort of one of the methods I'm going to be talking about, which is just going out and approaching strangers and talking to them. But how many people actually do that? Like, let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, we're all human. We all got flaws, you know. The reason why we need to be in a church that encourages us to provoke unto love and good works, because normally, you know, when you go about your life, you, you may not ultimately just do that, right? Now, if somebody, let's say somebody is doing that, right? Let's say somebody is so spiritual, you know, and I don't even say I'm that spiritual, right? I need encouragement too. Let's say somebody is just so spiritual that they just, of their own volition, will just go out and just go, go preach the gospel out on their own. Well, you'd, you'd think that that person should be like somebody teaching others how to do it, right? Because that, they're, they're proactively and they, they know what they're doing, right? So then, wouldn't you take somebody along with you to go and talk to these strangers, wherever you're talking to them, you know, whether it's at the shops or at the public place, whether you're going to go door to door, you'd say, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm going to try and make disciples and teach somebody else how to do it. Well, now you're going to have to set a time. When do I meet with this person to then go do this activity? Right? Ah. So now we're back to, let's set a time where you can meet with people to then go out and can bring people along with you. So that's why I'm saying, like, look, if you're going out and meeting people you don't know, hey, more power to you. That's great. Because that's no different to doing evangelism. That's ultimately what it comes down to. It's like, how do you go and meet strangers who you would not otherwise meet to talk to them about the gospel. Well, where can you meet people? You either meet them in a public place or you go to where they live, right? That's why there's two different ways to really just go about doing it. And they all sort of come back to these methods, right? Because even if you create an event, you still got to get the word out there unless you're going to spend lots and lots of money advertising. And then, you know, I remember talking to somebody and, and them saying, um, yeah, but we can, you know, if you, if you had like somebody rich, you know, they could spend like tens of thousands of dollars advertising on social media and putting up billboards and all that sort of stuff. And I just think, well, if you're going to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising, why don't you just pay your pastors? Like <laughs> pay the people that are going out preaching the gospel. You probably get more people to hear the gospel just when people can, you know, the preachers that already are in the world, you know, be supported, that would be a better way to spend that money than giving it to all the marketing companies and putting up a billboard and things like that. So it comes down to just preaching to strangers in a public area 
or door knocking. That's the only way you can just like proactively meet people that you would not otherwise meet. And sometimes people, <sighs> I got, just got so many thoughts in this area, but you know, sometimes people say, you know, but you know, when you go and, and talk to people in a public area, they don't want to talk to you, or they go to you, you go to their door, they don't want to talk to you. Hey, there's, there's, there's not really much you can do to make the gospel popular. So, you know, even if you have a gospel event or anything like that, it's no different. You know, people, there, are, there are people out there that don't want to hear about spiritual things. But that's not who, who we're looking for. You know, when you go out soul winning, you're not looking for the people that are disinterested, right? You're just going through the doors to find the people that are interested. And you will find people. You know, there's plenty of people that we talk to all the time if we go through and we talk to people, whether in public areas or not. Now, what are the pros and cons? So you can go to a public area or you can go house to house. And why do I think house to house is better? Well, what are the pros and cons? Well, in a public area, the reason why I prefer going door to door, and there, there are pros and cons, is in a public area, people tend to be doing errands. You know, so like when they go into a public area, they're, they're on their way doing something. Whereas, you know, at home, you know, I think there's more chance that they may be just hanging out in their home because they, they're where they live, right? Also, when you're talking to people out and about in a public area, the person that you're talking to is more self-conscious. I mean, think about how you think when you're, let's say you're sitting at a bus stop or you're sitting in a park and there's other people there and then maybe there, you, there's some people from another church going through or there's some marketing people going out and giving out flyers and things like that. Now, how do you feel as an individual when you get approached and then they're trying to talk to you about something? You kind of feel a bit more self-conscious, right? And you, you know, unless you are in an area where you can have that conversation, then you may be a bit more self-conscious. So that's what, that's what I found. You know, if when I used to do street evangelism, we used to go to the city in Perth a lot. And if it was a busy day, and you're trying to approach people sitting on the benches and things like that, they're a bit self-conscious. It's a bit you have to. It's a, you have to be. You're a bit more self-conscious as well because you know you then now aren't just approaching an individual. You have to like approach an individual with a whole bunch of people looking at you, and it just makes it a little bit more difficult. Now I'm not saying therefore it's wrong. I'm just saying these are the challenges of that sort of method. So it requires a bit more boldness from the new Christian and also it requires you to find somebody in a place where they're you know, separate, where you can have that conversation. So I'm not against that. Now, what about people that don't visit that public spot though? Because what I also found when we used to do street evangelism in Perth and we went to the city every Sunday is it's like the same people like, that go there all the time. So you end up talking to the same people, seeing the same people, and things like that. Now, why do I think door knocking is necessary, and why do I think it's important? Um, there's this verse in Acts 5, 42. It says here, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So we already talked about what can compare in cost and benefit to just walking up to somebody and trying to strike up a conversation and talking to them about the gospel. Now, when you go to their house, when they're home and you're able to strike up a conversation, you're immediately already in a private setting, right? Which is why I think one way it's very good because when you talk to them out and about, you, you may have a crowd, right? You may have people looking. But then if you're going house to house, when you talk to them, you're already in a private setting. And it's somewhere where they're comfortable because it's like it's their house. They can tell you to buzz off if they don't want you to be there. And they're more than happy to do that. Whereas in the public area, you know, they're just a bit more self-conscious and things like that. They may not even be listening to you. So this is one way, one reason why I prefer going house to house. Now, one of the cons is, and you know, some people think this, is like, oh, they think that the house is like a personal area. So that's, that's one thing that people think, oh, that's because they're not comfortable going to people's houses. But think about this, and this is why <clears throat> I think we will always, churches should always knock doors. Because let's say, for example, we have a mission as a church to preach the gospel to every creature. And let's say we chose, instead of door knocking, to just go to a public area. And we go to like Liverpool's train station, 
every Sunday, and that's where we were, that's where we are preaching the gospel. And you think like, okay, well, that's, you, you also talk to a lot of people and, and all that sort of stuff. But then you think, look, our church meets here on a Sunday morning. And you think, okay, we spend years and years and years going to Liverpool Station and we talk to all the people that come and go to Liverpool Station and, you know, but then we never, we never talk to the neighbour across the road. You know, we never, we never went one block over the house that's just around the corner to knock on their door. And you think, like, isn't that just... Wouldn't, isn't, don't you think, like, if a church is in an area, don't you think at the very least they should reach the people that live around the area that they meet? And that's my thought. Well, how are you going to reach them? Well, you reach them by going to where they, you know where they live. Go talk to them. So I'm not saying that going to a train station or going to a public area is a bad thing. You know, you'll still go and talk to strangers. One thing I try and promote when I talk about soul winning is, you know, we, everyone just has to be, be taking part in evangelism where you talk to people that you would not otherwise come across. That's what I mean by proactive evangelism. I don't think it's good enough for, for God's people to just talk to people that they just come across. Like it's a convenience. You know, we have to do more than that. Right? So that's why as a church, one of our missions is to go eat into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why churches that don't have evangelistic outreaches, it's just a shame. And I'm saying it's a shame if a church meets in a certain area and they don't even reach the people that live around them. You know, how sad is that? If at, the, if at the very least, you know, the houses that are in the blocks around here should get some literature from us or have somebody knock on their door at some time in the life of the church meeting here, right? And the only way you can do that is if you knock on their doors, right? And door knocking works. You know, that's like ultimately, you know, how you go reach people. And this is why salespeople do it. This is why political parties do it. Because if you want to get a message out there to go talk to the individual, right, and engage with them, that's the way you do it. All right, so in conclusion, Matthew 9, 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So I hope you understand the reasoning there that door-to-door -door soul winning is not there just because that's like a traditional method and we're just continuing this traditional method. The question is, how do we reach the people that live in this area? Right? We want to, give, we want to go out and give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. The way we do that is we go house to house and go talk to them. Right? And that's why we go door-to-door -door soul winning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, for your word. And uh, I pray, Lord, that people understand um, you know, what we are doing here. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll uh, bless our time here and uh, bless the soul winning this afternoon as we go out and preach the gospel. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.